This family of moth insulators is not a well-known family of moth insulators, but I will show you that there are interesting properties. So this work was done in Nantes at the Institut des Matériaux Jean Roussel with my co-workers and also in collaboration with some groups in Grémont Tour, Institut des Nanosciences de Paris in uh, Paris, and the group of uh, Marcello Rosenberg in Laboratoire de Physique des Solides. Okay, so let's start with a very, yeah, so, yeah, very, uh, very basic definitions. Uh, a metal is a compound where the electrons are free to move and they can hop from side to side. And if you look at the uh, electronic structure of uh, metal, you will always find a band of bandwidth, the width W, which is not completely filled. And you see here that you have a finite density of state at the Fermi level. On the other hand, if you look at a mot insulator, uh, in a mot insulator, the electron motion is frozen due to the electronic repulsion that ripple the electron from side if one wants to go from one side to the other one. And when the, electronic, the, uh, the energy of this electric repulsion is larger than the bandwidth, it opens a gap at the Fermi level between the two subbands, the lower Hubbard band and the higher Hubbard band here. Usually in mod insulators, gaps are of the order of the EV. If you look at the resistance versus temperature, this is well known for metal, you have a straight line that with a resistance that decreases with temperature, while for a mod insulator, the behavior is insulating with a resistance that goes up when the temperature goes down. Okay, all the talk will be to find ways to go from this insulating behavior to this metallic uh, phase. Okay, so uh, a first way to break the mud insulating state is to induce a bandwidth control insulator to metal transition, and this can be done by using some pressure. When you uh, use pressure, you just force the atom to get closer together, and you will reinforce the overlap between orbitals, and therefore, you will increase the bandwidth. At a certain point, the two subbands will come in contact together and overlap, and you will restore some metallicity and induce an insulator to metal transition. If you look at the density of state of a correlated metal, it is a little bit different than metal. You have a quasi-particle peak at the Fermi level, but it's roughly the same. Okay, so if you look at under pressure at the phase diagram temperature, versus pressure phase diagram, you will find a mud insulating state which is stable up to a critical temperature. This is a mud line. And on the left, uh, the right part of this phase diagram, you will find the metallic state. Okay, for in real system, it's a little bit more complicated. Here I pick up one example, it's a kappa chlor system. And you always find mud insulating phases on the left part of this diagram here either paramagnetic mud insulators or ordered magnetically mud insulators. And on the right part, you find the metallic phases, and this line departs the insulating and metallic side of the transition. Okay, here in this kappa chlor system, you have even superconductivity that arises at low temperature. Okay, another way which is well known to break a mud insulating state is to induce what is known as a filling control mode insulator, uh, insulator to metal transition, and this is just by adding or removing electrons. So you have to do chemistry to do this. And when you put another electron, you just restore some uh, density of state at the Fermi level, and you induce an insulator to metal transition in this system. There are very uh, uh, well-known systems that behave like this. I pick up the two famous ones. The first series of compounds is manganite, here you have a dope mud insulators. When you dope lanthanum by strontium in manganite compounds, you reveal a very rich phase diagram in composition with numerous new phases here. The most famous one is called FM here, and it's a ferromagnetic uh, uh, phases. And this phase is very uh, famous because at the, when you enter in this phase domain, you have an insulator to metal transition. If you apply some magnetic field, you reduce a lot of resistance. This is called, known as a colossal magnetoresistance effect. Okay, so this makes this family of compounds very famous. The other one, everybody knows this one also, is the cuprate family, 
when you dump a mud insulator cuprate, what you do is to reveal this phase diagram, which is general uh, phase diagram, and you enter in this phase here, which is the super ITC superconducting phase. Okay, I show you this uh, example, which are very well known, because when you have a new family of mud insulators, you better try to induce either a filling control or a bandwidth control insulator to metal transition and reveal very interesting properties in the vicinity of the insulator to metal transition. Recently, we got interested in this family of compounds of composition AM4Q8, where A is gallium of germanium, M is the transition element, vanadium, niobium, or tantalum, and X is sulfur or selenium. Okay, so this compound has a very nice structure, a lacunar spinal structure, and you see here a very nice feature. They have tetrahedral transition metal clusters, and if you look at the distances within these clusters, they are represented here, you have very short distances between the metal, transition metal elements, less than three angstrom, and this means that you have metal-metal bonding. While between these clusters, the distances is very high, four angstrom, which prevents metal-metal bonding. This has a strong impact on the electronic structure. If you look at the calculation that was done in the group of Docker in Germany, they were able to calculate the uh, molecular schema uh, diagram of this cluster, and they found that there is seven electrons in these clusters with one electron which is unpaired on the highest orbital. In the solid, you would expect this band, this level here, to form a band, which is uh, roughly like this, and you expect to have this band which is not completely filled, so you would expect a metallic character. But here things are a little bit more complicated because the clusters are far apart, which means that the bandwidth is small. On the other hand, if you want to take one electron from this cluster and put it here, it will be confined on a very small domain, and therefore the electronic repulsion will be high. And this will open a gap at the Fermi level, and for this reason, these compounds are believed to be narrow gap mud insulators. So maybe there is a controversial aspect on this, but I will show you that this is indeed the indeed the case. Okay, let's uh, see if this m compound here, M4Q8, behaves as real mode insulators. And can we be sure of this? If you look at the evolution of a mode insulator under pressure, as I've shown you, you will start from this band structure and end up to a correlated metal. So you expect an insulator to metal transition, and indeed under pressure, the group of dark current was, were, able, they were able to show that this compound, GATA4SA8, you can induce under pressure an insulator to metal transition. You turn from resistance which goes up to a resistance which goes down, and even at low temperature, you see that this compound becomes uh, a superconducting, have a superconducting behavior. Okay, so this may be due to this change of electronic structure, but it could be also due to another type of phase transition. So it's not a clear proof, but it's a first hint that we have a bandwidth control metal insulator transition in this system. Okay, so if you want to make sure that you have this evolution of the electronic structure, you have to do some optical conductivity measurement because optical conductivity measurement will help you to see at the low energy excitation of your system. And in a, band, in a band structure like this one, the excitation of low energy are between the low upper Huber band and the upper Huber band. So you expect to have a single band in your optical conductivity spectra, centered at the value of U here, which is the electronic correlation. And indeed, when we did this experiment with our colleague Vin Tafiok in Tour, we observed that this uh, optical conductivity can be well described by a single band centered at an energy of 0.5 EV. Okay, so if you would turn to a correlated metal, then you would expect three types of contribution to the spectra. The first one is the same as here, the excitation from lower to upper bar band, but you would expect one excitation in, within the quasi-particle peak, and one excitation from the lower Huber band to the upper Huber band. And so the optical conductivity should be the sum of these three contributions, and when we do the experiment at 10 gigapascal, you see that indeed we can well describe this 
optical conductivity by these three types of excitations. Okay, so we have a clear proof here that we have a mod insulator compound. And uh, another way to break the mod in oh, I have forgot. We can just sketch now the uh, temperature pressure phase diagram of our system like this. The mod insulator phase is stable up to 6 gigapascal. Above this pressure, you have a metallic phase. And at low temperature, and I like you to rec uh, recall this. I will recall this uh, later. So uh, there is a superconducting transition at about 6 to 7 Kelvin. Okay, we are trying now to, to fully understand this phase diagram and we are doing XRD and resistivity measurement under pressure with Carlos Sasha here in Buenos Aires. Okay, so another way to break the mode insulating state is to induce an insulator, an insulator to metal transition driving by filling control. Okay, so if you look at the structure here, you have two ways to do that. Either you can dope on the gallium side or you can dope on the vanadium side. And I show you the first experiment when we doped on the vanadium side. If you replace vanadium by titanium, you can remove four electrons out of these clusters because titanium has one electron less than vanadium. And this is quite challenging from a chemical point of view, but I show you here with this XRD spectra uh, diagram that uh, indeed, you can do the full solid solution between the pure vanadium compound to the pure titanium compound. And we have studied the evolution of the structure along this series. And I show you here that uh, the, main ev the evolution of the main distances between the transition element. And as you see on this uh, figure here, the transition metal get uh, in, within the cluster, just the distances in the, within the cluster is elongated with, on going from the pure vanadium compound to the pure titanium compound. In the meantime, you are removing a lot of electrons, so you are expecting a very huge impact on the electronic properties. And indeed, when you do the resistivity measurement on this series of compounds, you start from an insulating uh, GAV4S8 compound to, and you go to the pure titanium compound, you end up to a metallic character. Here, the insulator to metal transition is gradual. And this is quite surprising for a mod insulator system. And we can understand this easily. We are doping on the metallic site, and you induce a lot of disorder in this system. So you are mixing a different effect. And indeed, if you look at theory of uh, insulator to metal transition driven by disorder, you end up with this uh, theory that cell use that at the transition, the resistivity follow a power law dependence, and this is achieved in our system for the term x equal 1. And this means that all compounds here on below 1, x equal 1, close to the pure titanium phase, uh, pure titanium compound, are in the metallic regime, while the other one are on the insulating side of the transition. Yeah, we, we have done this here. Here, this has a, a typical dependence for hoping like behavior. So there is no problem. Yeah, no, we didn't just. Yeah, but we, we follow this path here. Okay, so what is interesting in this family is to look at the magnetic properties. You start from a spin half mod insulator that shows a curry vice law, and you end up with a metallic character, a metallic compound that has a polyparamagnetism behavior. On the metallic side of the transition, you should expect a polyparamagnetism, but when you measure this compound, you have, in fact, a curry vice dependence. And at low temperature, you, still, you also have uh, a magnetic loop here in the magnetization curve. And this tells you that the compounds are ferromagnetic. OK, so we could understand this by doing band structure calculation with our colleague in North Carolina State University. And they show that the band structure is uh, very typical of uh, half metal with a density of state which is zero for one direction of spin and which is non-zero for the other direction of spin. So this behavior, magnetic and uh, metallic, can be explained by this band structure. Okay, let's move on to an, another example which is 
more interesting, is to dope the compound not on the metallic site, which induces some disorder, but on the gallium site here. And you can dope this replace gallium by germanium, for example, and you can add up to one electron to this system, and you do not expect anymore any disorder effect. So we did this, and I show you here JV4S8, a four contact measurement, you have a nice insulating behavior. And once you put some germanium inside, you induce an insulator to metal transition, you lose some orders of magnitude on the resistivity, and you have a metallic character at about 25% of germanium doping. What is, again, very interesting to look at in this family of compounds is that GAV4S8 is a mode insulator which is ferromagnetic at low temperature. And here you see that uh, this compound, GAV4S8, has a ferromagnetic loop, and also when you have a dope compound with germanium, you still have this ferromagnetic loop. So you have ferromagnetic and metallic character. And this is a rare example. Another example I showed you before is some case of manganite, where you have this ferromagnetic transition, and at the ferromagnetic transition, if you apply some magnetic field, you can induce this negative colossal magneto resistance effect. And we were looking at uh, such effect in our sample, and I show you here one example where the compound here, the red curve here, it's a, for a compound which is doped with 3% of germanium, and we applied some magnetic field, and you see here, by applying magnetic field, you can reduce a lot the resistance of the sample, and we have indeed a huge magneto uh, resistance effect, negative like in the manganite in our compound, which is maximum at TC, and reach some 80%. Okay, so, I've shown you all this example of uh, pressure-induced uh, metal insulator transition and doping-induced uh, metal insulator transition and all these experiments because I want to say that this compound, this family of compound is a mud insulating phase which is behaves like other canonical mud insulator phases. But uh, for sure, uh, uh, there are a lot of studies on mud insulators but so far, there are not much application of mud insulators in real day life. The reason is because pressure, you have to use an anvil cell, a diamond anvil cell, and doping, you have to have a chemistry lab to do this, and you don't have this in your pocket. If you want to turn mud insulator interesting for microelectronic devices and do what uh, Marcello used to uh, call modtronics, you have to turn to something, another parameter which is used in microelectronic. This is, uh, for example, electric field. And the question, we, we have something very sensible under pressure or doping, and the question is whether these compounds are sensible under electric field. So the next uh, part of my talk is devoted to this. I'll show you one example here. When, when we, where we have done one uh, experiment of resistive switching on a crystal here, m 4 q crystal with tantalum and selenium, you have a, a nice insulating behavior. And at this temperature, 77K, we applied a series of pulses. Here I show you the voltage pulses of increasing intensity. And at certain level, what you see is that you have a huge resistive switching, orders of magnitude, you lose orders of magnitude at low temperature. Okay, what happened during this last pulse which shown here, it's a five microsecond pulse, and you see that the resistance goes down in less than 100 nanoseconds to a low resistance state of, uh, of the order of 650 ohm. Okay, so this is a non-volatile effect, I have to, to say, because after this pulse, you can measure again your sample, and you see here a new behavior for the resistivity versus temperature, and this is no longer an insulating state. Okay, so uh, we have shown that this behavior is uh, observed in the whole family of compound, of mod insulator compound, and I show you on this slide several examples of composition, and let's look at these two. They do not share any common elements, so the chemistry is not involved in this uh, resistive switching, and the filling of this compound is eight electrons per cluster, and this one is uh, only seven, so the filling of control is, uh, of uh, uh, the clusters is not involved. Okay, so we can go from the high resistance state to the low resistance state. Can we do the other way around? And I show you here on this slide that we were able to do resistive switching, reversible resistive switching by applying other pulses. Uh, either on the same polarity or, or reverse polarity. 
And this effect is huge at low temperature. It's less uh, important at room temperature, but still you see these two levels. Okay, so I will come back to this at the end of my talk. Okay, so these compounds are of good uh, are a good example of compound that can be used to build up a resistive RAM uh, memory, so we, we work on this. First thing we, we wanted to, to know is whether this uh, uh, resistive switching is a mechanism close to something already described in literature. And one example of mechanism that was done in this review, for example, by a group of uh, VASA, is uh, one type of resistive switching which is known is interfacial related uh, resistive switching uh, related to the short key barrier between the metallic and the uh, compound and you can reduce this either by charge injection or um, ionic migration. This is an interfacial uh, behavior. On the other hand, you have a lot of uh, uh, example of compound where you have electron migration of oxygen, copper, or silver. I like this picture here of the group of Vaza where they were able to to see the growth of filament of uh, titanium reduced species here. And this was discussed during this uh, conference a lot, so I will not spend time to explain this. Both cases here, you have a bipolar effect. So we can, at first, uh, hypothesis exclude this mechanism because we have a unipolar effect. Okay, unipolar resistive switching are known in the literature, and you have a thermal mechanism uh, like in nickel oxide that explain a unipolar uh, resistive switching. Here in nickel oxide, you apply a pulse. This nickel oxide is over stoichiometric, and you create a nickel filament, and therefore you have a resistive switching. You can melt this filament, and therefore you have a, uh, the other way around in the resistive switching. On the other hand, on vanadium oxide, you have a transition, a phase transition from um, an insulating monoclinic phase to a tetragonal metallic phase. And if you are here and you put some electric pulses, you can cross this metal insulator transition and induce a resistive switching. We saw this in detail yesterday. So can we have one of these example uh, uh, type of uh, resistive switching in our material? This is a question that we try to, to understand. Okay, so if you look at this uh, uh, mechanism, it induces some, uh, some chemical change. In, on the other hand, here, you have a transition of uh, structures. So you have structural or chemical changes. And we looked for this type of changes in our compound. I'll show you one example here where we were able to put one slice of our crystal between two electrodes and we took out a piece of our sample between these two electrodes by doing some uh, FIB experiment. And we used TEN to look through our sample. And as far as I can see, there is no uh, change in structure. On the other hand, we did a lot of experiment to try to do mapping of the uh, chemical composition with our, with, within our sample between the electrodes. And as I show you here, the niobium content, gallium content, and selenium content is always the same within this sample. So we do not think there is chemical or structural changes uh, uh, in our sample. Okay, so at first step, let's uh, exclude this mechanism and say that we have a new mechanism. Okay, so let's turn now to the resistive switching. This is a typical current IV curve that uh, is represented. And, um, when you are here at low voltage, uh, you see that uh, we were able to record the evolution of resistance during the pulse. And here, the dots represent the resistance before the pulse at low level. And during the pulse, we were able to monitor the resistance evolution. And after the pulse, measure again the resistance after the pulse at low level. When you are here, nothing happened. You just measure the resistance, which is the same as before and after. When you are here, you induce a resistive switching. I showed this before, a very fast effect. And then you, have, you are, during the pulse, in a low resistance state. After the pulse, when you remove the voltage, you stay in a low resistance state. This is this one. OK, what, what we found out is uh, that above a threshold field here of about 10 volt in this case, you induce a very nice volatile resistive switching. And if you see here, the time evolution of the resistance 
you have at the beginning of the pulse a resistance which is comparable to the resistance before, and a very sharp transition to a low resistance state, and after the pulse, you come back to the high resistance state. And as you can imagine, this uh, volatile transition contains a lot of physics, and we have uh, centered our uh, attention to this volatile transition. So let's do now some uh, more uh, details about this transition. First, this is a typical uh, example of a uh, uh, circuit we use to measure this. When you do this type of uh, uh, circuit, you can measure, monitor the uh, time evolution of the voltage in your sample, and in the meantime, across a load resistor, which, tell, which helps you to know the intensity through your circuit. And here I show you that for a small pulse, uh, amplitude pulse, you can monitor the evolution of intensity and voltage through your system. Nothing happened here, but you have IV, so you can put IV in your IV diagram here. And if you do this several times, you can see that at low voltage, you have a home slope. On the other hand, if you cross this voltage threshold here, you end up with a resistive switching here, volatile. As you measure V and E, you know the resistance through the, of the sample, and you see this very nice resistive switching. But on, this, on the other hand, you have two set of points, IV points, that you can report on your diagram here. And what is very interesting, if you do this several times, is that the voltage after the transition always falls on the threshold field. Okay, so if you do this with DC experiment, you expect to have some kind of very long pulses, and you should follow this path here. And indeed, when we did this, this is really what you, you see here. So what tells you this experiment is that the transition is triggered by the electric field, and you have here a threshold voltage of the order of 2.5 kilovolt per centimeter square, which is quite low. Okay, so we did some uh, uh, calculation, uh, Marcello and Pablo Stoller did some calculation to see if this effect could be due, due to Joule heating, as in VO2, for example. And they have done some modelization using a resistor network and a thermal conductance network. And they used, for the evolution of the resistance versus temperature, this curve, which is the experimental curve, an activation law. And I show you that they were able to compute the evolution of the temperature within the sample when you apply a pulse. So here is one output of this calculation, where you see how the temperature within the sample when you apply a pulse evolves during time. And you see here the color code, code, for, code for the temperature evolution. And you see here the creation of a nice hot filament. And this nice, nice hot filament will create a reducing of the resistance of the sample. It has to be. So indeed, when you do the, this Joule heating meeting model, just tell you that the resistance during the time will go down like this. And the voltage evolution versus temperature is versus time is represented here. And you can extract a high V curve that shows what was already shown yesterday, uh, non-linear, uh, non-NDR uh, effect, uh, NDR, uh, non-differential resistance effect. Okay, how can that, does it compare to our uh, phenomenology in GTA 4 sa I show you here that there is huge differences. In any case, this Julieting model can explain this sharp transition in the middle of the pulse. And in the same time, the IV curve is not also uh, well represented. We do not see here any NDR region. So this is not a thermal effect like in VO2. Okay, so can we go beyond this? I'll show you again another experiment we did uh, by doing some chemistry. Uh, chemistry is very interesting. If you replace here selenium by tellurium, you are able to do some kind of pressure effect. Pressure effect is just when you apply physical pressure, you just put the electron closer to, together. But if you use another element which is bigger, you are able to mimic this effect by chemical effect, and this is known as chemical pressure effect. So we have studied this series of compounds and see how it evolves the threshold field in this series of compounds. Let me show you how it works. Here is the structure of GATA4SA8, and you want to put selenium in, 
terrorium replace selenium by terrorium in this compound. At the beginning of the solid solution, what you see is that terrorium occupies this site close to the gallium atom. And the main effect is just to put the, uh, um, uh, the, the clusters far apart. So there is one trend here. And once you try to put more terrorium, you will fill this site around the tantalum cluster. So you expect two, time, two type of trends within the series. And indeed, when you look at the resistivity versus temperature curve and you extract the band gap out of this activation energy, you see that from the pure selenium compound to a compound that contains four type tellurium, you increase the band gap and then you go down. This is much more easy to, to see here. So this will help us to see how the, how the threshold field within this series of compounds evolve with the band gap, the mod gap. And here I show you this picture I've already uh, shown before. We have a threshold field of 2.5 kilovolt per centimeter. And if you increase the band gap, you see that the threshold field increases. On the other hand, if you decrease it, the threshold field decreases. So there is a trend, uh, a relationship between the threshold field and the band gap of the mud insulator. And this is for the whole series of compounds. You can see that you have threshold field dependence versus a gap, which is a power law dependence. Okay, so that again says something very interesting about this transition. It's a non thermal transition, it's triggered by the electric field, and it's an electronic transition likely related to the mud physics because it depends on the mud gap. Okay, this is finished for this uh, volatile resistive switching. Can, what can we next learn about this non-volatile resistive switching? Here we can study because it remains after the pulse. And we have done a collaboration with a group of INSP here, Dimitri Rodichev and Tristan Kren. They are skilled at uh, STM measurement. And here I show you that how samples are very nice because you can cleave them and reveal very nice um, surfaces with large terraces here. At low scale, what you see here is that you have this uh, very flat sample, very flat uh, surface, completely homogeneous. This is before the pulse. After the pulse, it's no longer the case. The sample shows at large scale very nice flat terraces, but at low scale, you have a surface which is no longer homogeneous. So there is two reasons for that, two explanations that could be found for that. The first one is that now the surface is corrugated. These images are done in topographic mode. So the STM tip just adapt to the height of the surface. Or now the surface is no longer homogeneous from an electronic point of view, and the surface will just goes down when a uh, goes up when a metallic site uh, appears. I show you here a combined spectroscopic and uh, topographic uh, study where they could show that indeed the electric pulse creates some metallic domains at the nanoscale in the sample. Here it's just after the electric pulse. You see here this metallic domain appearing in the, the compound. Okay, what is very interesting again with this experiment is that successive topographic uh, uh, ramp, ramp it, were able to create some uh, resistive switching at the nanoscale with the STM tip. I show you this here. As you can see here, you create one uh, metallic patches and it, you can remove it by another pulse so, uh, or voltage ramp. So you have a reversible insulator to metal transition at the nanoscale. If you look at this picture here, you also see that each time you create an insulator to metal transition, this is associated to a deformation of the sample. Okay. So we have tried to understand a little bit more this deformation by doing another type of experiment. In this experiment, the STM tip will stay at a constant height. It will not move anymore. And we will apply a pulse between the STM tip and the surface here. And look what happened. This is incredible. The surface just inflate below the tip and induce a tip crashes. It's a very reproducible effect and you can even uh, 
writes the name of the laboratory at a nanoscale on the surface of this compound. Here, the line is 10 nanometer wide. You could use this as a recording media like a CD-ROM, and you would have one teradot per centimeter square, which is a huge recording media. But here, we have revealed a huge, gigantic electromechanical effect. And this uh, led us to uh, propose the thing here. The electric field creates some deformation in the sample. And it might be that in our sample, the electric field helps you to explore the phase diagram temperature versus pressure and help you to cross this mud insulating line and induce an insulator to metal transition at the local scale. And if this is true, you should even be able to find a superconducting behavior at low temperature. And I show you here the same experiment I've shown you at the first, uh, uh, the first slide. This is the resistive switching I've shown you, but there is a small transition here we didn't pay attention to. And if you look here at the zoom, you see that even when we put some magnetic field here, five Tesla, we were able to remove this transition. This is a strong sign that you have a superconducting transition here. It's not complete because you have only small pa metallic patches that become superconducting, and this is typical of granular superconductivity. So this is kind of proof of this proposal. Okay, uh, can we use this to build up a, uh, um, a device? We have a new functionality, a new type of resistive switching. Can we do this type of uh, devices? Yeah, um, I've done some uh, collaboration with uh, ST Microelectronic, which is a company in France and Italy, and we uh, were uh, trying to do these thin films. Okay, so here I just showed that uh, we were able to grow thin films it's my colleague, uh, colleague uh, Marie-Paul Bellon, that did this work. And uh, the thin films are polycrystalline, so it's different than the crystal we were using before. But even though uh, we were trying to do some main crystal, uh, metal insulator, metal uh, devices, it's a, a very simple homemade device. We did it by hand, so uh, it's a very large pads. Pads are about 50 microns, so don't expect too much out of this. And I'll show you here that even though they are uh, homemade, they are of very nice quality. Here we pick up a slice of uh, the device and did some focus ion beam uh, uh, experiment to take out a thin uh, part of uh, the device. And we could show that the interfaces are very nice between the gold, for example, and our compound. So we did some resistive switching on these devices, and I show you here that you have roughly the same behavior than on crystals. Okay, so we are doing now better on uh, devices. I don't have time to explain this in details, but I show you here that we were able to, to do uh, devices with two by two micro square uh, uh, pad sizes. And in this case, we have resistive switching at room temperature with a very large, a very larger uh, uh, memory window or R on R of ratio. So this is quite uh, 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 interesting for us and we are pushing in this direction, going lower in dimension to increase this memory window at that time. So it's almost time for me to, to finish uh, here. Yeah, uh, sorry. To go back. So I want to say that uh, we have here a, a new family of mud insulators that behaves like a, a canonical mud insulator compound. It's not as famous as uh, VO2 or uh, nickel sulfide or VO3, but it may become very interesting because it's, uh, it behaves really as a canonical mud insulator family. It has a pressure induced insulator to metal transition and also doping induced insulator to metal transition. And at the vicinity of the insulator to metal transition, we were able to reveal very interesting properties, half ferromagnetic metal, colossal magnetoresistance, and uh, superconductivity. On the other hand, these compounds are very sensible to electric field. They show a resistive switching, which is triggered by the electric field, which is, to my mind, one of the first examples. And they are quite interesting because even at room temperature, you have a huge effect and it's a promising issue to format memories, I think so. Okay, it's time for me to uh, acknowledge all my colleagues. This work was done in the framework of uh, 
French National Research Agency project called Nanomod here that gathers people from INSP. I showed the work of Tristan Crane and Dimitri Rodichev. We are working a lot with Marcello Rosenberg and Pablo Stolian. We are glad he comes in, into this uh, uh, project. Uh, Marcello and Pablo are doing a lot of simulation and modelization of, of this resistive switching. We have nice results, but I cannot speak about them uh, yet. Vintafioc did a lot on the optical conductivity. We have also nice results uh, coming out. And all my colleagues here, uh, I want to point out the role of uh, Marie-Paul Bellange. She's doing most of the work on scene films. And Etienne Janot and Benoit Corraz, who, who build up this project together. And I'm happy we were a lot of, to work on this project because we, we could have uh, become crazy on, on this. Okay, other person from a different university and our financial project support. I'd like you to, uh, I want to thank you also for coming this morning after this nice uh, dinner we had yesterday. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you Laurent for this very nice talk. So the session is open for questions. Really fascinating data, and I would like to ask a couple of questions. Uh, you were showing first how with pressure you can go uh, through the mode transition, and uh, as you know, most people who have studied this in vanadium oxide or in, or in organic pot systems, they see this first order line and the critical end point, and I think this is particularly interesting because, you know, the, when you have a coexistence, you can presumably easily switch from one phase, even locally, now, have you actually studied, I haven't seen in your data the critical endpoint, and let me just, before I, you answer, let me just tell you why I'm particularly interested in myself, because uh, you, are, you are interpreting some of the resistivity curves through disorder theories, and you may ask, you know, is this influenced by disorder or not? Turns out in organic mod systems, uh, they have actually recently, Kanoda has studied this uh, crossover region uh, much above the critical endpoint, where you see resistivity curves that look very similar to yours. And as it turns out, we have proposed that this high temperature region can be described as a quantum critical region associated with the mod transition. And we proposed a particular scaling of these curves that they have actually confirmed in several organic compounds. So it seems that at least in, in these materials, uh, you know, the, the fact that the resistivity curves can go from insulating to metallic, they can be very well described by mod physics without disorder. And of course, in your case, disorder may be more important, but you know, I think it would be interesting to look at uh, phenomenology of the, of the transport and try to, uh, you know, compare with the analysis that Canada did and, and other people like that. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Uh, we are doing a lot. Uh, I didn't show most of the results, but Carlos Sasha is doing some pressure uh, induce uh, resistivity measurement uh, under pressure and uh, resistivity measurement. And they kind of agree with theory. So Marcello is doing also DMFT calculation with some person here. And uh, uh, there is kind of agreement with what theory tells about mode transition. And uh, our critical endpoint, uh, we have done a lot of experiment. We, we could see uh, under X-ray that we have a, a regime of coexistence even though we, we took this very recently. So there is uh, uh, a very good agreement with the mod insulator uh, theory, and uh, the critical endpoint could be around 100 or below 100 Kelvin. So we have some kind of oscillation in, in the resistivity measurement around this temperature. So I, I, I really agree with you. We have other ex information to extract from our data. Okay, another question. I would like to comment also about this transition induced by uh, under some type of uh, disorder. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could extract some, I mean, mobility age or some critical value from density of, of, of impurities that could be, I mean, if you do some sort of scaling analysis, all these parameters could be extracted. That could be a yeah. interesting information in order to have, for example, if you have an effective 3D or 2D, I mean, yeah, from yeah. Uh, we, we tried uh, this scanning, uh, and it works at the transition. We, we found something like it's compatible with uh, uh, T minus uh, T uh, minus one fourth or something oh, okay. like this. So we have this type of scanning. I didn't show this here. Uh, the switching in the crystal, you 
did the measurements at room temperature or at lower temperature? What is the temperature that you Okay, we, we, we did both. Uh, both. The amplitude of uh, the, the resistive switching mm -hmm. increases at lower temperature. So it's much easier to uh, study at low temperature because you see an uh, on-off ratio which is tremendous. Okay. At high temperature, uh, on single crystal, uh, if you do large uh, electrodes, you have a resistive switching of a few percent, of 10 percent, 30 percent at most. Once you start to reduce the electrode sizes, this goes up like crazy. We have example on, uh, on 200 nanometers where we have a factor of 100. So uh, I Thank really you. think it's, it's, we believe it's a filamentary uh, type of conduction and that the resistive re uh, ratio, resistive switching ratio is increasing a lot when you don't scale. It just doesn't help when you just do the thin film at the yes. end, you have huge ratio. And yep. is it due to the fact that it is amorphous and no more crystalline or just... No, 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 it's scaling? crystalline. It's, it's completely crystalline. Uh, when I, I go back to this, uh, I show you the powder pattern here. Indeed, when you, you do the first uh, uh, deposition, it's amorphous, but afterward you do some annealing and you recover the structure. So it's fully crystalline, and, and I show you this here. Uh, you have granites of the order of 30 nanometers, so no problem with this. It's not amorphous crystalline transition. Uh, uh, 